future. The established successful practices of yesteryears are no longer aligned with the requirements of tomorrow. The all-important question in these challenging times is what will it take to be relevant to customers, to employees, the community, investors in this new era of uncertainty? In this setting, we bring you globally renowned management guru, Professor Shrikant Datar, Dean of the Harvard Business School. A big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Professor will give us uh, a deeper understanding of the new trends in management, navigating uncertainty in the post-pandemic era, and draw on his vast experience to guide Indian executives on global trends on business. He serves on some of the most powerful boards in the world, and we look forward to this enlightening masterclass today. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. It. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Business Today Masterclass with the Dean of the World's Top Business School, uh, Professor Shrikan Datar. Uh, I remember sitting in Professor Datar's class and his words ring loud in my ears. He said, don't be innovative when you're accounting <laughs> and don't think like an accountant when you're doing innovation and design thinking. It boggled my mind that there is a professor whose knowledge base is so wide and so deep that he teaches accounts, governance, and control, and at the same time, he also teaches design thinking and innovation. To my mind, those are completely <laughs> different streams of thought which require a different mindset. And to have one person who can traverse these different streams is quite phenomenal in terms of what it will take to train your mind to be able to do that. To add to this, Professor Datar is a top expert in Africa, and while I was on campus, he was teaching an executive program to Africans on Africa. He's a Mumbai boy. <laughs> uh, double gold medalist uh, at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad and at the Institute of Cost and Work Accountants of India. Professor Datar has a master's degree in statistics, economics, and a PhD from the Stanford School. Um, this is the first time that Professor Datar is speaking at an Indian media event after becoming dean, so we're very happy to have him over here. And what makes this especially uh, important is that uh, we were in the last batch before he got promoted and became dean, so we've been in a class and there's a special connect, and I look forward to the opportunity of being able to grill and cold call <laughs> my professor. So please join me in welcoming to this Business Today Masterclass Dean of the Harvard Business School, Professor Shrikant Datta. Thank it's you, fantastic, Bill. and thank you for taking our time from your holiday and joining us here. A pleasure, thank absolutely you. a pleasure. And uh, since you're going to cold call me, I might take the opportunity to cold call you too. Oh, good uh, lord. <laughs> so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds dangerous already. I am forewarned and very careful. So there's been so much talk, Professor Datta, about how the pandemic has changed the world as we know it. You talk to so many top professors, you've got students and executives from the world's top companies coming. Why don't you kickstart this conversation by telling everyone sitting here watching you live about how you think key management practices are changing? What are the big trends that you're noticing in management practices in the post-pandemic world? So I'd say the several things that have uh, happened. And uh, I was sort of fortunate that I started my term as uh, dean right around the time, so uh, it's in the middle of the pandemic and in the middle of an academic year, and no, I, I would not recommend that for anyone uh, to be becoming dean because uh, 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 each of those has some challenges. But what is incredible is the amount of opportunity that that uh, creates as well. So I spoke to nearly about a thousand individuals, uh, went on a listening tour for a, nearly about four or five months. And uh, there were three things that emerged as big topics that uh, uh, people were saying are important trends that are uh, coming. One was uh, the focus on digital data work. And I would say that at some level, the pandemic accelerated by years the speed at which companies are now engaging in that uh, work. We can talk more about that. So that was one uh, major uh, learning. A second was, and I've always been a vocal proponent of the fact that uh, business is a force for good in the world. If you look at the number of people 
that have been lifted out of poverty, if you look about the products and services that we have created as, uh, as business individuals, if you look at the kinds of jobs that we've uh, had, it's been an enormous force for good. But right around this time, one looks at the challenges in the world, and yes, one will always look to governments to uh, play a role, but there are some amazing opportunities that come from those challenges. And so the idea is how should business begin to think about its role in society was a second big thing that happened. And remember, this is in the middle of uh, the pandemic where there's a health crisis, there's a social crisis, there's an economic crisis. So people are were looking for what's, uh, what role can business play. And the third, of course, is the major trend that occurred in terms of uh, uh, the future of work. And, of course, as in all countries, the great uh, reset, some call it, great resignation, others call it. Uh, how exactly should we be thinking about uh, the way in which we would engage uh, individuals inside organizations? So those were the three, I think, big trends that certainly I saw uh, in my first few months. The pandemic challenged all of us as leaders. Uh, many sitting here would wonder how do you think leadership styles need to change in a post-pandemic world? Because people now see the world differently. Yeah. To be able to motivate, align your workforce yeah. to achieve management goals, how do you think we need to change and evolve as leaders? So I think, uh, again, several, several trends that you can already see. So one of the important ones is uh, a tremendous amount of focus on ESG issues. So it's already people are yearning for more uh, understanding of what is that role that uh, business can play. You also see a much heavier focus on purpose, much more than we have seen in the past. So the idea, why should someone come and work for a company? What is their broader purpose? Of course, we always want long-term profitability because without that, there is no sustainable business. But what is the broader purpose for someone to uh, come and work? And I think from a leadership point of view, it has raised issues about uh, resilience. So how do, you, how do you build resilient organizations that are able to contend with the uncertainty that you were describing earlier? How do you act speedily? Because I think you can't now work at the same pace that you were working at before. So leadership uh, in that, so agile speed. And then just being very resourceful and adaptive. So I think it has caused the focus of leadership to shift in these ways because of the events that have transpired. Now you mentioned the great resignation. I think one of the big issues yeah. managements and HR departments the world over are grappling with is trying to get the workforce back into the office. Yeah. And now that so many people are used to working in their pajamas, they see no <laughs> point in getting ready, putting on a suit and a coat and a tie and showing up at office. Yeah. So is this the way you think it's likely to stay? What's your advice to management trying to grapple with? You want those young, talented employees. You'd ideally want them back in the workforce. But that young, talented resource says, hey, I can be on a beach in Goa. I can be up in the hills in Leh. Why should I come to the Mediaplex? You know, it's uh, actually fascinating to think about what some of the data already shows. It shows, on the one hand, individuals wanting this flexibility that you were just speaking about. But on the other hand, it shows a desire for individuals to want to stay connected in some way to the work that they're doing. And of course, these are sort of contradictory in some sense. On the one hand, you want a lot of flexibility. On the other hand, you want some uh, connection. And I think what this is things that will, I think, work out over the next uh, a uh, few months for sure and perhaps uh, next couple of years. But I think what, given this tension, what organizations are trying to think about is, is there some innovative way where you can actually respond to both? Mm -hmm. So for example, organizations are thinking about anchor days. So where you get the ability to have this community that we're uh, speaking about, but not necessarily everyone showing up at the office all five days in a week. Uh, because of this uh, flexibility desire as well. And I think there's a lot of 
experiments being run at the moment and we know that even in very desirable jobs when executives said no you have to come for all five days people are saying no thank you and how do you then create those cultures so that you can actually have people coming together and uh, working together providing this flexibility and so individuals are and, and hr managers are are grappling with this idea about uh, how do i have these anchor days so that people will come but what is important is trying to think of those days and this is a major hr challenge i think across all uh, all companies that we've interacted with which is how do you have those days where it is attractive for someone to come even then you don't just automatically say yes you'll come although i think there will be a little bit of that push as well but the pull of how do you make it attractive for uh, individuals to come so i think it's a uh, there'll be many experiments run i think at the moment everyone is saying let's try a few different things to see how it will work out in iceland we'll at see. this moment there's an experiment which is being watched the world over on a yeah. four day work day yeah. i'm sure everyone sitting here saying ha ye ho jaye to bahut acha hai do you think this is a pipe dream or could it be the new reality you know it's a i i don't think uh, certainly if i'm speaking about the us situation it's not there yet but if you're saying four day work day in the office people would be very happy if that was the conclusion right now if you are one of those who wants everyone to come into the office uh so i think it's still the flexible work day is still the one, a trend that is uh i think uh, or, or certainly the uh, dimension that everyone is trying to work uh, toward uh but you know it could come it could it could become a four day uh work week certainly you're seeing a lot fewer individuals showing up in the office on mondays and fridays that i think we are uh, already observing but i don't know if you want to call that a four day work week because people are still expected to work on monday and friday maybe in their pajamas as you said <laughs> what's your advice to people sitting here and watching you on how to deal with the great resignation the fact that in lucrative sectors where job avenues are opening up yeah. you now have a situation where people join yeah. uh they could join yeah. they may not join yeah. they could uh seek an offer get a increase on that offer yeah. uh and leave in a couple of months like yeah. there's no sense of real loyalty yeah. uh and management is saying but you're a critical part of our growth plans yeah. and now suddenly you're gone so yeah. how, how how do you think company should be dealing with this so i think uh, you won't be uh, surprised to hear me say this that uh, i think this is a really a classic design thinking problem in the best sense of that term uh it is how do you deeply understand exactly this tension that i was talking about in terms of flexibility on the one hand and the desire to have community on the other and how do you design both the workplace the work itself the opportunities for development that bar is think has been raised and so i think companies as as we were discussing earlier will continue to try to innovate to do that to do that I think companies are going to have to figure out ways in which uh, uh the development of these individuals is going to be seen as more and more important. And where I'm seeing some companies already at the leading edge begin to think about it is how do you think about those development opportunities so that individuals see their careers rather than only their jobs. See the more you are focused only on the job all the things that you talked about are likely to happen. Mhm. but if you can focus individuals on development and careers the opportunity for you to say therefore and of course first line managers will be very important everything is the, all of these i i don't think you're going to get past this by just saying you have to show up i think we know already from the data that that's not now the only caution i would have there is whether this is a Uh, a a more temporary phenomena or is this more permanent i definitely don't think it will go back to where it is but will it swing back a little more we don't know that's so something we that now is. have a situation where on the one hand you've got jobs which are being accelerated because of greater digitization yeah. where there's immense demand anybody yeah. in that space is yeah. just very happy with the yeah. way things are and then there are those who don't necessarily come from technical backgrounds yeah. uh, for whom computerization and digitalization isn't necessarily what they've done all this while yeah. and their upskilling becomes very critical yeah. but do you think that those who come from non tech backgrounds 
now just have a disadvantage that you need to live with or what would be your suggestion on how they can actively upskill themselves in the absence of technical know-how? So I would think it's a, it's a huge mistake if people think that just because I need to have technical skills, let's say humanities, uh, skills of people are uh, uh, you know, not important anymore. And I was mentioning in, uh, in one of my uh, reunion talks at uh, HBS that uh, one must always think about uh, technology and people as two sides of a coin. The more you build technology, the more you have to think about what is the impact that's going to have on people. And I said in my reunion talk, so I, I, and I'm of course very proud to say it uh, here again, is that uh, for me, much of that uh, learning and understanding came from Gandhiji. I mentioned in my talk that uh, my father was part of the freedom uh, struggle, very much uh, follower of Gandhiji. So we learned Gandhiji's seven deadly sins, you know, as a very important thing, lesson to absorb. And so even as I think about some of the things that we're talking about, imagine what this would do, science without humanity. Potential for commerce without morality. Potential for knowledge without character. And of course, I would also add pleasure without conscience, and then there are the other three that may not directly apply in this particular context. But I think it's crucial that every time we keep raising the bar on what happens with technology, you are at great peril if you ignore the humanity or the connection with people uh, to occur. So that's on one side. So I think it's a huge mistake. And that certainly at the business school, we have we are very careful, even as we are creating these new institutes uh, for digital and data and design and business and society, we are very carefully considering how you think about people as well as, you, as technology. Technology is definitely going to keep going. In fact, it's going to go faster. What we have seen is uh, going to keep accelerating. Think about uh, Web 3.0. Think about uh, what will happen in the metaverse. Think quantum computing, edge computing. So it's going to keep going, no question. I think it's a huge risk if we do that at the cost of uh, people. That's sort of one. Second, there's a very interesting book that my colleague uh, Sidal Neely and uh, one of her uh, 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 colleagues uh, uh, at the University of uh, Southern uh, uh, California, Paul Lenardi, wrote, which says that, of course, you've got to have a digital mindset now as your, in terms of your leadership skills. But they call it the 30% rule. You don't have to be a real expert to the extent of 100% of knowing all these things. You don't have to feel like, oh my God, I don't have this skill and so I'm out. You actually don't need that. But then as you think about that 30% and you think about what does that do in terms of the ability to uh, achieve better coordination, uh, the ability to do better computation, the ability to think about change management, you can see already that there are so many elements here coming together. So I'm a big believer in the fact that even as these technologies go, uh, management and thinking about people, which is almost always at the core of management, will still be, if anything, an even more important skill. And each time I see you in action, whether it's in a classroom or uh, speaking at this Business Today Masterclass, I wonder how do you train your mind? Because accounting, and we've got the minister, Piyush Goel, sitting here. He, he's uh, a crack student himself back in the day. But accounting requires a certain mindset and discipline. Yeah. And on the other side, design thinking and innovation requires, at least from the outside, a completely different mindset and innovation. Because, you know, you have a certain image of, like you taught us, the IDEO case. Yeah. Uh, doing, so it requires a completely different kind of mindset. Yeah. How do you train your mind? What are the lessons you think everyone sitting here can learn from it? So first, I think uh, it's not as uh, big a deal as uh, you're pointing out, uh, Rahul, I'd say. Uh, it's, I'll say two or three things as to why I think, uh, first, there are many of my colleagues at Harvard Business School who would uh, be like that. In fact, my dear friend and late colleague, uh, David Garvin, with whom I wrote Rethinking the MBA, started as an operations management professor. You know, he was focused on if you think about the leading work on quality that David did uh, in 
in the um, late 80s and 90s, uh, it was all on that deep operational uh, uh, operations management issues. And then he completely switched to decision making and innovation and you know other uh, areas of general management uh, thought and principles. I think what is at the core is that you have a base by which you can actually go in different directions. And then there are two things, two ways you can proceed. One is you go with your particular toolkit and try and address as many problems as you can with that toolkit. That's a completely reasonable approach to take. Or if you've prepared yourself in a broad-based way and you start looking at problems, you immediately see that there are a range of uh, tools that you can use to address those problems. In fact, they can only be addressed with a range of tools. So often you might work with somebody else and therefore, you know, you'll have a Venn diagram so you know a little bit of what the other person knows, they know a little bit of what you know and you work a lot, lot together so you can uh, uh, think about the broader context in which these problems reside. And I think what has been particularly true of the Harvard Business School is the general management orientation that we take. This basic belief that just looking at one particular part of a problem isn't good enough. You have to look at it in uh, multiple ways. And so each will take a different form. In my case, it you know went into some uh, different directions. Certainly my undergraduate training in mathematics at St. Xavier's College in Mumbai was uh, very valuable in some of the work that I did uh, uh, in my research. But the idea that if you're looking at a problem and you're trying to think about where a solution might reside, it does tend to take you in very different directions. And what is fabulous, I think, about uh, our experiences and my experience certainly, is the willingness of the school to let you invest there. I think that's the key uh, reason that many of us have this more broader, multifaceted approach, is that the school lets you invest in those areas over four or five year periods because uh, if you have, I think the most important thing in academics is to have a particular passion and curiosity for something and uh, if you're willing to follow that, it can take you in many different ways. How strong are your Indian roots at this moment? I said we'll do a cold call, so if I were to question <laughs> you in Hindi, would you be able to give a good response no, in Hindi? I may Hindi? not be able to give you a good response Aap in Hindi. Karoge? <laughs> Koshis to kar sakta hon, lekin I'll give you the answer in English. <laughs> so try again. Uh, <laughs> we said we'll try. You know? I, I just hope but you Indian don't throw some multiple regression about. my way and say, okay, how do you crack this? But you worked at the Tata Administrative Services, right? Yeah. You were working with Mr. Tata. Yeah. When you look at what Indian companies do, what will you say if you want Hindustani companies to world-beating companies? You want to do a good performance in the world, but you want to perform better. Yeah. So, जो तमाम आप कंपनियों को एक्शन में देखते हैं आपके हिसाब से हिंदुस्तानी कंपनियों को क्या और बेहतर करने की कोशिश करनी चाहिए ताकि वो विश्व विजेता बन जाए सो आई इट्स अ इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन बिकॉज़ आई थिंक अटेम्प्ट्स दैट इंडियन कंपनीज हैव मेड टू मूव इन दैट डायरेक्शन हैव बीन यू नो मूव्ड एंड देन टेकन सो इट्स नॉट बीन एज सिंपल एज यू नो जा सकते हैं कर सकते हैं and I think it is a, a little bit about, uh, you know, naturally trying to appreciate the different ways in which, as you become more global, uh, you can work. And I think because the, by the way, this is true for Japanese companies too. If you think about it, you can obviously give the counter example of a Toyota or Honda, but they can, I can give you examples like companies like Nippon Steel and others that were at the very top that didn't. I think when the local market is very big, uh, the automatic pressure for you to start going global is not as strong. And to become more global, you end up having to think so differently about what the particular context is that you are, uh, uh, that you are operating in that uh, it's, it's a little more of a challenge, I think, for companies to, uh, to do that. But I would say that Certainly, in my early years uh, working with uh, Mr. Tata uh, in um, uh, in uh, India, I still remember to this day, and mm -hmm. fortunately, he does too. Whenever he does come to visit us at the at the business school, and uh, I, I, I spoke a little about it at the at, at my commencement speech this year, 
about how inspiring it was for us to think about uh, Sir Jamshed Ji Tata and the way he set up the organization and the way in which the contributions to society were made from the trusts that owned uh, the, uh, and, uh, the, the shares of uh, Tata's and the, and the profits and how they were uh, uh, utilized, whether it's health, education, uh, uh, so, many, so many areas of uh, social welfare. Uh, and then what is very interesting for me is when I worked with uh, 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 Mr. Ratan Tata, the problem I was working on was uh, at that time, which I hadn't quite understood in as deep a way, was how do you share risk on the one side and create incentives on the other? And I probably wrote four or five papers uh, in my academic career just based on that particular problem that he and I were uh, thinking about uh, in my early years. So I always attribute a lot of my um, uh, career and early contributions to Ratan Tata's uh, way of just framing problems in a way that got me very excited about certain types of tensions that exist uh, that could benefit from more academic research. You mentioned globalization. During the pandemic and even after, there's yeah. been a big debate about the future globalization uh, takes from here. On the one side, you've got the argument that, you know, this is more about localization or mm -hmm. regionalization. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, companies want more resilient supply chains mm -hmm. and they look to go beyond China and therefore mm -hmm. countries like India have a big opportunity. Mm -hmm. The other argument, which is uh, held very strongly by many professors at HBS, yeah. is that this is more talk. Yeah. You know, it's good for you guys to say this on TV. In yeah. reality, <laughs> money will go where it makes sense for money to go and yeah. that still uh, it still makes sense for money to stay in China and that's just the reality of value chains and the way that they're developed. They're so entrenched that it's not going to change. There may be some superficial change on the margins, yeah. but there won't be deep-rooted change. Yeah. Which side of the argument do you come out of? So I think there is no question that the current pressures are such, you, you've seen the disruptions in global supply chains that have occurred, and the need for, so when you were talking earlier about uncertainty and the need for resilience is causing a lot of companies to uh, do much, much more in terms of trying to think about these alternative supply chains, if you will. And that's not just in materials, because that's the area that we are most, uh, most obvious and most familiar with. But if you think about uh, individuals and the opportunity for them to, you know, get uh, uh, the, the right kind of skills that they, may, that they need, you see companies like Microsoft and Google already investing heavily in developing talent uh, in reskilling. Of course, that's already needed for the new digital world. But they're investing a lot of talent in reskilling because it's a matter of, it's not just the return, Raul, on the one side. Of course, that's true and that it'll, that it'll always be there. It's a matter of risk on the other side. So just like in all these decisions, how much risk are you willing to take uh, when these... Uh, uh, possibilities are much more uh, pronounced now that it might get disrupted than they were in the past. So I see definitely a, a, a trend towards uh, more regionalization occurring in the in the short run. But like you said, eventually, and and of course one never knows the the both the geopolitical as well as the economic issues are such that. Uh, you know, you, you might see a more sustained period where there are, and by the way, the world has always seen this, right? It's, globalization has never been just one way up. It's come, it's come down. There have been significant periods of uh, regionalization or deglobalization, followed again by re-globalization. So we may be in one of those periods where it is down at the moment. I think if you look over longer periods of time, I agree with you, it will probably continue, uh, globalization will continue. But the risks today are sufficiently pronounced that alternatives are coming up. But once these alternatives come up, if people think very innovatively about the kinds of alternatives that come up, they might start becoming attractive enough that you may not rush to it uh, quite as uh, quickly. So I'll give you an example of uh, a project that we're doing at the Harvard Business School today on what's called the 110 Initiative. And the 110 Initiative is is arguing, and by the way, I think there'll be opportunities in many countries that we might be able to do similar things. Uh, one stands for one million, 10 stands for 10 years, 
and the goal of the 110 initiative launched by two individuals, Ken Chenault and uh, Ken Frazier, is to employ these individuals who do not have a college degree in living wage jobs in corporate America over 10 years. So you're going to employ 1 million over 10 years. None of them have a college degree. They only have a high school uh, diploma and may have done a couple of years of community college, but if that, not, but certainly no degree. And what this research shows is that there are many companies that require college degrees in their jobs, which are actually not needed. IBM, for instance, uh, 20 years ago or thereabouts, we just have a, completed a case on them, 90% of their jobs required college degrees. Today, when they actually look at the jobs, it's less than 50%. So if you believe, as I think most of us do, that talent in this world is much more evenly distributed than opportunity, you now suddenly, rather than keep looking for people who happen to have college degrees, you suddenly are opening up your talent pool to a large number of individuals who are talented, skilled, motivated, capable, but just because they don't have the credential are not really uh, you know, getting that particular job. Well, that's going to change dramatically what the economics of is going to be. This is one of those where I think is fantastic for business and fantastic for society. And if we can figure out how do you select these individuals, train them, develop them inside organizations, so we have committed at the business school significant resources to uh, figure this out because we actually think it has major implications for the world and uh, the business school has an opportunity here to do things that uh, uh, will make the world a better place. And uh, if we can get that done, now suddenly this feeling that any time I wanted, I need to get another educated person in another country at a lower cost, will now get changed to saying, no, I can find someone locally at a much lower price, but who can actually do the job very well. So, yes, there'll be these trends. Yes, long term, it'll be not go back to a, you know, a, a low period. But uh, temporarily, I do sense next two, three, four, five years, a lull. You know, Naina Lal Kidwai is here. She was at your commencement address yes. and she spoke, she told me that you spoke very passionately about your Indian roots. Yeah. And it often come. Uh, I often wonder why is it that so many top CEOs in the United States, especially in Silicon Valley, are of Indian origin? And how is it, and I say this with no disrespect to professors of any other ethnicity or nationality, that how is it some of the biggest superstars of academia also happen to be of Indian origin? What is the team? Look, you see, they are of a particular. We have, I mean, it's so competitive to be here. It's not much for you to get into any of these institutes that we are talking about. That you are already at some level. I say that. I think that most of us would say this, we basically won the lottery in our life, right? Because we just happen to go to places like I am Ahmedabad. It doesn't mean that the next 180 people at the time I went were not as good as, just nasib tha, ki amara number agya. And, but of course there was, there is that, 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 that the talent that is going is of course very, very strong. You then work with, I mean, the amount that each of us has learned from our colleagues who are there, just like all of you learn when you're at the business school from your uh, colleagues who are there, is enormous. So you're m meeting wonderful people. You are given that opportunity. Uh, and, of course, you have a certain amount of curiosity. You have a certain amount of, you know, you work quite hard. You carry those skills with you when you go. And I also think, and one should look at it in a more uh, general way, I don't know if, in fact, that is completely, despite what I just said, I don't know if it's completely true. Because as you know, in statistics, you always find these couple examples and you say, oh my goodness, this must be what is actually happening. Uh, not always clear that that's the case. If you look at the total number of people who have gone and you say, yeah, you might you might see, of course, you know the ones who have succeeded and those are the ones that you always uh, think about. But I think one has to be extremely humble about this and just recognize that we were extremely lucky, I think, the most important part. Uh, in my own case, I would certainly say that I was privileged uh, to have the parents I did. Again, did nothing to 
deserve them other than God's grace and luck. Uh, but, you know, I grew up, my father was an academic, so I grew up in a very academic uh, household. And uh, my grandfather was uh, a scientist and fortunately received the Padma Bhushan in 1964 for, he was the director of the Indian Council of Medical Research. So we grew so up. So Padma stay in the family. So uh, passed on uh, generation uh, to generation. Again, <laughs> all, uh, I, 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 I've often said that when I saw who else received it, uh, when I did, I didn't think I deserved it nearly as much as some of the others who were there. I thought they were amazing individuals. But uh, it just that it, it's, uh, you know, you, you grow up in a certain way and then that luck carries through. So I'd put it more to that, Rahul, than That's anything else. a lot else. of modesty there. Uh, I want to throw this open to the audience for questions. So you can think of what question you have in mind. We'll send a mic across. If you were rewriting your book, rethinking the MBA, uh, business education at a crossroads, and if, I think you wrote it in 2010, if you mm -hmm. would write it again, mm -hmm. what would the genesis of the book be? How are you rethinking a, uh, the future of the MBA? What does an MBA from here on look like? So I would still be uh, as uh, uh, positive and uh, as... Uh, uh, Hopeful as I think we were in 2010 about uh, the value of this degree, uh, because it's a, it's just a different way in which uh, you think. And I, I think the mistake that uh, people make when they think about the MBA degree is just the knowledge that you get in different subjects. That is certainly true. But this ability to get things done, the ability to uh, engage in different discussions and debate so that you're constantly learning how to learn, which I think is a huge part of what happens in MBA education, and making judgments all the time. You know, you're always making judgments as, you're, uh, as you well remember, Raul, when you were in class. Uh, always making judgments and you're listening to other people's opinions and trying to understand what you just, you just get. I mean, when I speak to the alumni, one of the things they say is that method of trying to, and, and this happens across MBA programs in different ways. We probably are at a, at one uh, end of that spectrum. But it just allows you to be so aware of different points of view that you get to understand the world so much better about what's coming than, you know, if you don't have that kind of training. And then the ability to deliver across and execute and get things done. I think where it, so there'd be a lot that would stay, I, as you might recall in the book, we talk about knowing skills, doing skills, and being skills, and I still think those are very important. We just talked about being a little bit earlier. But I think where it would change now would be a little bit around what you asked me at the beginning. I think there'll be, we had talked a lot about business and society, even in rethinking the MBA in 2010, we'd have probably talked about it differently now. Uh, and again, just thinking about issues, uh, like uh, uh, equity that we were just talking about, like climate, uh, I think there are going to be some big opportunities for business in these areas. And then, of course, on the what you had already asked me about digital and data. That how, how do you perceive the India story at this moment? If somebody looking from the perch where you are were to look at what uh, the Indian government is doing, yeah. policy maneuvers, what more would you like to see beyond what is happening? for India to be able to realize its true potential in your view? No, I mean, I think you, you're already uh, seeing a lot of, uh, regardless, uh, you just look at long spans of history and you're already uh, uh, seeing it. Of course, it's a challenge. There are lots of challenges. But I think the issues that we were talking, that you and I were talking about earlier are all there. I mean, look at the amount of technology and, uh, and entrepreneurs that are, that are coming out of India at this point in time. In fact, I happen to have the privilege of serving on the board of governors of both uh, I am Ahmedabad and I am Calcutta and never at the time when I was at the institute would I see this many entrepreneurs coming out of those institutions. It's just staggering what's happening. That's all coming because they, there's a different environment uh, that's being created and, and uh, lots of opportunities that people see uh, and the ecosystem I think is really important that you know you think about of course regulation, you think about uh, uh, access to finance, you think about uh, access to capital and uh, talent and teams. I think it's, you, you can see distinct changes over, certainly when I think about 
you know, my class that I'm on the bus and I think about the class that I see graduating now, very, very different. And in a very positive way, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic what's going on. Can I cold call the minister, please? And uh, get you to get, 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 no no I, I, hear, 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 hear my question. This cold call. Hear, hear my question. He, you know we get to hear from you, today. Minister Goel, on commerce, on industry, on railways. Can somebody just have a mic sent to us? Do you do you do you do you want to reflect on your time at uh, the Management Institute and how it helped you train your mind? Do you want to just? Uh, your class, na? Mere class mein hai, like, no, how, how do you think your time at the management institute, Minister, helped you train your mind? And what is it that you picked up from a classroom which you think is relevant for what you do as Minister uh, in trying to shape policy? Can we just have a mic brought across, please? Thank you. Thank you, and it was very interesting to hear you, Professor and your thoughts about India, the thoughts about the post-pandemic world. I've, of course, only been able to spend a few weeks at Harvard Business School, much as I would have liked to complete my program. <laughs> but circumstances have not allowed me to get back to school. I think uh, getting back to school on only opens your mind once again. Uh, you spoke about Mahatma Gandhi. He never went to business school. Yeah. But his lateral thinking probably beats all that I mean, we would do after a exactly. uh, degree at uh, exactly. Harvard Business School. Exactly. So I think it's more each individual's ability to cull out of whatever education or whatever life's experiences are. Yes. I've always enjoyed academics. I've always wanted to pursue academics when, when I was uh, in college or there, thereafter. So for me, it was a great experience to be at Harvard Business School. I went to boarding for the first time in my life. So that itself was a big, a big excitement for me. Uh, even despite the fact that those rooms were so small. That I, I actually got somebody from Harvard asking me, are you sure you'll be able to handle that? But uh, a great experience just to kind of open your mind to newer ideas, newer ways of thinking. And all education helps in your work, whatever each one of us here is doing. Yeah. I'm sure Rahul will be a better anchor after his studies at Harvard <laughs> Business School. And I hope he'll uh, do really well for the country. Yeah. And as each one of the students who works there, I also benefited tremendously from the short time I was there. Yeah. Most important lesson, if at all, I think uh, I got back from the few days there, was about peer learning. Absolutely. And I think... Uh, both the case study method of uh, teaching and the fact that you cannot evolve unless you are a part of that team, both within that small group in your, uh, within the group that's preparing for the next day, the class, and then the entire uh, 600, 800 people, I don't know how many yeah, were there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That old di yeah. dynamics was a great pleasure and a great learning experience. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, it's something that will have an indelible mark in my mind and my work always. Yeah. And I would look forward to getting back there. <laughs> we look forward to having my you. studies there. We we all dropouts do really well. I mean, many of the dropouts <laughs> do really well. And you go and happens to be one of them. His son did go and complete and complete it Dhruv in fabulous yes. style. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Naina Lal Kidwai has a question. Ma'am, can we just have the mic sent across, please? Thank you, thank you, Rahul and uh, Dean Srikant Datar, who really did us proud at the India proud at uh, the commencement ceremony, which you uh, just described, where he talked about the Tata Group. And my question is uh, really around the repurposing of business. You mentioned about business and society. Are there some countries, companies in some countries, that are getting it better than others in this post-pandemic repurposing of business? And how does India score in that uh, repurposing? Or is it too early to ask? No, I mean, if you think about, I always say, if you think about what India did in this domain, I mean, the fact that, and, and obviously there's always issues around implementation and so on uh, that we always have to worry about. But if you think that, you know, in our public companies, 2% of our profits are going to be de dedicated to 
countrywide dedicated to doing that, that's amazing. I mean, it does say that, you know, we do care about uh, what bigger a role business can play. And we did that presumably because we felt that uh, business, because of the way they do things, can actually make a difference in these areas, right? The skills that we have are such that it can be actually applied there. So I think, and I know there are, having read a little bit about this, there are, there's criticism about whether it's done the full correct way or not. We learn, we'll, we'll get there. But that's a, I think it's a very bold move. It's one that has moved it in that direction uh, very, uh, very forcefully. But of course, you know, you'll always uh, hear about companies that have done amazing things in terms of uh, that, right? If you think about the US, you think about uh, uh, companies like Ben & Jerry's that have always worried about how they think about their impact on society. You think about, uh, uh, you know, Patagonia and what they have done in terms of the impact that they have. Uh, but I think it's it's getting more and more impactful for this generation. If I talk to our students now, talking about the difference that Raul was asking about, they are driven by purpose in a very significant way. They really do care. Of course, you want to be sustainably profitable over a period of time. You know, uh, when we launched, so we launched these two new institutes at Harvard, uh, one the data the design data and digital data and design institute at Harvard and the other, the Institute for the Study of Business in Global Society. So both were launched this year. Both we thought were important things for us to launch because we were, you know, moving so fast that uh, we couldn't have research go linearly when the world is changing exponentially. So that was the logic of why we did it. Uh, but we asked Satya Nadella to come and launch the institute, the Business and Society uh, Institute. And Satya was... Uh, superb in the way in which he described why what we were talking about a little bit during my commencement speech and what we are talking about now is so important, which is if you think about long-term sustainable profits that a company should earn, and that's what he says he is unabashedly looking for. He says, if I want that in his talk to us as to why we should do more in this area, and by the way, we're likely to introduce a small course in the MBA program, we're just in the process of beginning to think about how we might do that. Uh, he said there are four things that you should think about while you're doing this. Number one, you must, every time you're doing that, see if your products can be inclusive. Because it's more likely if your products are inclusive that you'll have sustainable profits. Everything is connecting to sustainable profit, but you must have products that are inclusive. Second, you can't do anything that violates fundamental rights. And whether that is institutions, weakening institutions, or if it is uh, weakening uh, the ability of individuals to perform, it will truncate what those long-term profits are. So don't do that. Number three, don't do anything. The planet is going to have finite resources, so don't ignore what that will happen, because otherwise you're not going to be sustained. There, you know, you'll, you'll have all the kinds of issues we are already seeing. And number four, take actions that increase the trust that society has in business. And you just think about those and you say, yeah, I mean, it makes sense if you want long-term sustainable profit. So he says he has to keep pointing out why he's taking money out of today's profits in order to do these things because they'll sustain profits over the long run. So there's some, I think this is something both because of employees, investors, the whole ESG debate, Nana, that you're familiar with, uh, ESB a movement that you're familiar with, uh, uh, whether you're thinking about that or employees or customers or suppliers or communities, they're just playing a bigger and bigger role in business. And I think it's all because it will al allow these long-term sustainable profits to uh, continue. You know, Pradeep Gupta is India's top pollster. Uh, he also is uh, an alum and has a question for you. In fact, there's a case study on him and his company, uh, which just got uh, published recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, I'm a student I, of Professor from OPM 47, exactly, Unit 3. Exactly, I remember, yeah. So, Professor, my curiosity is if uh, there is no pandemic, what is your views on, or rather pros and cons of offline classes and online classes? And also, work from home and work from offices. Yeah. So and there is no pandemic. 
yeah if there's no those scenario yeah, yeah yeah no no in the non pandemic scenario what would happen so i think what would have happened is that's what i said in these years the acceleration that has occurred in these areas has been very sharp and quick and it would have been much slower but uh, so i think if there were no pandemic work from home would have taken a lot longer uh, to happen because we've always would have worried about the downsides of it as being a very very big concern and so we would not have done it so i have no doubt that that i also do believe that online education would have been a lot slower than what it is uh, right now but we talked a lot about the work from home let me talk a little about uh, online education i'm actually a and rahul and i had the opportunity to talk about this right at the start of the pandemic uh, when you had a group of us together uh, talking about this this topic i actually think that online education is going to create some amazing opportunities uh, for the world because uh, of the access that it quickly provides to people i'll give you two or three quick examples of why that is uh, wonderful so if you think about how the pace at which someone learns and how they learn it's not the same now when i'm in class and i'm trying to explain you know a particular uh, uh, rule or a particular uh, policy in terms of how you should uh, you know finance something or account for something you know you basically aim for a certain percentage of the class let's say if you go too fast you lose everyone if you go too slow you'll bore everyone so you kind of figure out you know how fast should you go and you're constantly scanning the audience to test whether you've got that right and figuring out who's sleeping who's not no that i don't <laughs> allow so <laughs> cold call coming for sure then Raul. so uh, but if you're learning at different paces online allows you to really learn at your own pace in a way that in class does not uh um, so i think that's a huge advantage of online second it allows geographic distance as well as uh time to be you know uh a, a friend so there are individuals who are all over the world who cannot come to the business school because of various constraints um we are doing so many of our programs whether it's uh, gmp or amp or any of our executive education programs uh, partly online so blended programs and partly in person it just makes it a lot more convenient for people to come and sometimes the topic is such so i teach a online course on design thinking it's so much better for someone to be at their work absorbing the material that uh, we are delivering and then actually implementing it at work rather than coming to hbs keeping notes then going back and figuring out what you want to do so that's where a longitudinal benefit of online learning comes and of course i hope that over a period of time one of the benefits and one of the major things that we are doing at the business school right now is a digital transformation of the campus i hope that over a period of time we will be able to our mission is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world that's the mission of the business school and i hope with online we will be able to share the privileges that we have with a lot of people all over the world because if in fact our content is something that is worthwhile and helps the world we should find ways to actually do that and as we continue to deliver on uh, uh, online approaches that's what we'll aim to do so I think both would have been much slower uh, to, to the point you're making, uh, Pradeep. But I think uh, that though that's part of the silver lining because of the pandemic, it's moving fast. I'm a big believer that we should do much more online, and we'll have to figure out uh, work from home as we were discussing <laughs> earlier. Just wait for the mic to come. Uh, hi professor i mean i had the uh, privilege of being in your class um uh, you know this whole topic of back to office uh, you mentioned about this whole tension uh, you know between flexibility and uh, belongingness both Correct. together yeah. uh, you know is there also a tension between choice and purpose uh, and i and i and i believe in in a lot of the things that have that we've seen panning out uh, it's 
choice versus choice, you know, organization's choice versus employee's choice, or at the best, it's organization's purpose versus employee's choice. Uh, the narrative has never been about organization's purpose versus employee's purpose. And is that the missing piece of how this back to work will pan out? Uh, so you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think, you know, particularly, as I said, uh, with the importance that this generation puts on purpose, uh, uh, it's something to that's it, that the point that you're making between individual purpose and uh, employee purpose and organization purpose is really important because it's the magnet that will cause someone to feel that yes whatever else is uh, uh, is happening in my life i i am able to fulfill my purpose in a in a more powerful way by being connected by being belonging by uh, doing things that i might not otherwise do so and I don't think that's the only thing that's going to make it work, as I was responding to earlier. I think there will be some, you know, balance that we'll have to strike uh, uh, between. But it's a tool or a approach or a mechanism that we should use. We should try to find ways by which, because it's good for business and it's good for us to do it, rather than only think about, you know, automatically how people will come back. And... Uh, I also think, as I said, that it, it will change over a period of time. I, I, I think there is a particular period right now where we are... It'll never, I don't think it will ever go back. I don't know, four-day work weeks, that's a question Rahul was asking about earlier. But I don't think it will ever go back. But I think there will, you know... And you're already seeing that, actually, to some extent. People are uh, missing uh, that uh, thing. But the more you can get purpose in, the more likely it will be that people... And we have to... That's why I think it's of it as a design thinking problem. How do you think about what the employee really would uh, appreciate and want that can then tap into... And we've always thought about that in management, right? It's all about people at the end of the day. How do you get people to do what they like in order to achieve organizational goals? So it'll be, I think, more experiments in that area. I, I think, and, But almost all my colleagues who do work in this area still say it's still a time for us to experiment. They are not prescribing at this point. We still need to learn a lot more. So we're coming to the end of uh, this master class. I have time for just a couple of last questions before we wrap up. That lady over there uh, has a hand up very persistently and for a while. Can we have the <laughs> mic sent across to her, please? So after this, we'll take one more question and then you could just possibly catch up with the dean once we're outside. Hi, Professor. This is Tripti, and um, my concern or my question is actually, we know every country's, uh, you know, base lies in MSMEs, micro, small, me medium enterprises. And right now, if you talk about countries, we all are talking about startup ecosystem and innovation. I understand you spoke about Web3 and NFTs, which is taking a lot of investment these days. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now every kid... Um, whether clearing an exam or um, college or school wants to start a startup and not go for a practical experience before starting this. So I see a lot of um, challenge in future for countries where the focus is on startup, of course, which India I'm talking about specifically, and completely ignoring MSME aspect, getting the right person is becoming so difficult. And on the other side, we are talking about unemployment mm -hmm. to get jobs. And companies who want to employ people are not getting the right resource because they may be interested in starting their own things. How do you see how to deal with this situation for the country, you know, overall. What do you think is coming and what, are we ready for this with innovation happening around? So I'm, uh, you know, more, uh, more positive about it, uh, I have to say, uh, for two reasons. One that, uh, uh, you know, these things have a way of, so you always, again, is the, is the statistics, the ones that you know about that you think, I mean, the pool of talent here is so vast that if you can, figure out what you're going to tap into and how you're going to tap into it. You know, it's, uh, it's something that if uh, companies worked hard at, they'll be able to uh, do. And I always think that, you know, one, one shouldn't think about the, the particular uh, circumstance, but think about the trajectory. So, and we know this to be true, that yes, some people will work, then they'll do a startup. We know what is the statistics about startups. Uh, 
So uh, if it were that simple, everyone would succeed. Most of them fail, we know that. Then you go back into the workforce and you're, you've learned so much in that process that you're better off by the time you go back and then you... So, it's, uh, so that's why I'm much more optimistic about uh, this dynamic way in which the uh, world is evolving and that people have the courage and the guts to try this and uh, uh, you know, want to do it. I'm often asked by my students when I'm, you know, I had the privilege uh, of uh, being faculty chair of the Harvard Innovation Labs before, so you know where my bias is already. Uh, and, but, but students would often come to me and ask me this question, exactly your question. Should I do this startup? Because the chances are very much that I'm going to fail. And if I had more time, I would have described to you one of those interesting conversations with one of my students, uh, Stefan Bansal, who became the CEO of Moderna and led us out oh. of this pandemic. <laughs> but we don't have time for that. But uh, I always encourage them, do it. You, if you are going to learn, just think about where you're going to maximize your learning at that stage in your career just maximize your learning. If it's a job, do that. If it's uh, uh, you know, a startup, do that. But be ready that it's not financial success that you're trying to build at that stage, but uh, your own uh, human capital. And if that's the better way to go, just do it. You know, Dinesh Bhatia is the group CEO of the India Today group. I've seen him at least at 100 events, never once before this. As he suggested, he wants to ask a question. So, <laughs> Professor Dattar, you clearly inspired Dinesh. Uh, go for it. Can we have a mic sent across to Dinesh, please? Thank you, Rahul. No, just a short one. I just wanted to know, do you see any big change in the way businesses are valued besides sustainable profits, which are always yeah. drivers of uh, valuations? Yeah. Do you see any elements becoming more important or any elements becoming less important? Or any big changes? There. So I think uh, if you th if you think about what I think sustainable profits obviously, but the other aspect of it is always risk. And the question that uh, besides the cash flows that are the sustainable profits is how risky are those uh, flows? And uh, some of what is happening, whether you're thinking about things like uh, uh, you know environmental risks or you're thinking about other social, socio-economic risks, people are paying more attention. I don't think it's you know fully in the valuation, but people are paying more attention to how we should think about those risks as we value. And uh, I think that sort of direction will continue, Dinesh. I don't think uh, that, and it's an important thing because at the end of the day, you do want to figure out what the risks are as you're looking at those returns. And so, uh, as those risks are changing, it's appropriate that they are valued. And the gentleman sitting there has come specially from New York. He said he changed his travel plans to come and listen to the deans. I'm going to give him uh, the privilege of having the last question. So go for it. Ajay, I think your name is, right? He came specially from New York and I came specially <laughs> from Boston to meet him uh, in Delhi. <laughs> no, thank you, Professor. It's a privilege, right? I wouldn't have missed it for anything. I was in Bangalore yesterday and my wife was traveling to, to Calcutta to meet her parents. I said, you go there, I'm going to Delhi to meet my oh, oh, I'm in big trouble with your wife, for sure. <laughs> so, so you'll deal, we'll deal with her later. <laughs> but thank you. So I'll go back to our popular you know, topic on the evening about work from home, right? So everything's great, fantastic, people are working from home. But I see a bigger problem there, right? Like earlier, people used to travel four hours, three hours, yeah. you know, in traffic, in trains, yeah. you know, to get to office and work eight hours. Today, they are working 14 hours, 16 hours. And productivity has almost doubled for organizations, right? So what do we see now for organizations? Organizations are taking this as, you know what, I'm getting more work than what I used to get yeah. earlier, right? Yeah. 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 So, so what does it mean to organizations, one? And secondly, what does it mean to people, humans, families, right? That's important. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's clearly the other side of it. I think uh, Microsoft has some analysis that they can do as to when you're there. And it was a study that they published where they are, they are seeing this. Uh, and I think this becomes, I mean, coming back to this sustainable long-term uh, situation, this becomes an issue for management now, and this is one more of those things where every time you're thinking about technology, never ignore the people side of it, just because the technology allows that. Uh, we have to, as leaders of organizations, think very carefully about burnout that's going to happen as a result of that, work-life balance in a different way that, is, uh, that needs to happen as a result of that, uh, 
So I think it will be incumbent upon uh, us as leaders to think about the topic you're talking about is a really important, complicated one. And uh, uh, I think, again, it's one of those things that in the early periods, you don't think about it. But I can assure you at the moment, a lot of companies are thinking about this because for the same reason that you're describing. So it's something that we ought to pay a lot more attention to. Okay, so we are out of time on this masterclass. You know, it's very rarely that you have a minister come, sit silently for so long, listen, absorb <laughs> everything. We've had people come in from New York. We've got people standing with uh, through the period. So you've obviously uh, inspired people to be here, and hopefully they've benefited uh, from your talk. I just want to have... Yeah. Now, before you close, yes. I think you have uh, some people from hospitality and travel, and it would be good for you to ask them um, about their um, a question since they are most affected by what has happened in terms of corona. We saw them cutting back and then having to deal with the deluge of the summer vacations and not being able to deliver. So yeah. this start-stop stop. economy, which is really difficult to find a rhythm in business. I mean, so, I, I'm asked that question, but I mean, I don't know, uh, Mr. Sikka or Mr. Shingi, whether you want to add to this. Hi, thank you so much, Professor, for doing this today. It was uh, extremely informative. I think just adding to what Kali said, um, we've seen this in multiple places right now, that while we've had the great resignation, we've also had people unwilling to come back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you got the chance to see this today. For the first time, an airport, Heathrow, came out with an advisory to airlines to say not to book more than 100,000 passengers a day. <clears throat> so I think seeing these kind of environments We've had industries like ours, which is travel and tourism and hospitality, which have been through fits and starts. Yeah. One big challenge which has been there is in terms of building employee culture yeah. and employee morale in yeah. an environment like this, yeah. right? So yeah. how do you really go about building culture? And culture anyways is hard to do. And then you spoke about you know providing employees with a higher purpose. Yeah. How do you do this in a virtual environment, right? In our organization, for example, we had people, uh, a large number of people who joined who had never really been into office. Yeah. And then suddenly one day, when the floodgates open, they are all expected to be fully up to speed with what's happening around them. Yeah. Right. So how do you go about building that kind of culture and environment where these kinds of disruptions are easily, or I wouldn't say easily, but at least are managed more effectively by companies? So I think this is this balance that we were talking about earlier and all of, by the way, this is a common, yours is a more extreme example for all the reasons that Kali you were mentioning and that you were describing. But this is a, this is a problem that most companies are, uh, are, are facing it at, in some form or, or, or the other. And this is why I think trying to think about how do you get this balance correctly because it's, Impossible to think about culture completely virtually because we are social beings in some sense. We like to interact. But if you look underneath the data, you do see evidence that actually people want to come together. It's right. They want both of these things. They're seemingly contradictory. can't happen. So will we change technology by which we can make this uh, happen? Of course we will. So what are we doing in our classes, for instance, at the business school when we're doing it online? people will linger, you know, because what used to happen when you went into class after you finished, you had 10 people come around your desk and you would be having a nice conversation with them. Zoom, you know, you click and you're gone and uh, it's over. So, yes, we will do that and there are water coolers and all sorts of new things happening. No substitute, I think, in my mind for the fact that how much I think is always going to be a bit of a debate as to how much you want. But I cannot see a situation where zero is the correct answer, where uh, people are not coming back to do it. And I think the challenge is, comes back to the earlier question that was being asked, is how do you make it attractive for someone to come? What is it that draws someone to come? Because, and as I said, I still think this is a bit of a temporary thing. My own view is that it'll it'll bounce back a little bit, because for the same reason that we are social beings and we will want to come back at some level. You don't want to come back five days a week and so that's another discussion of course. Uh, but trying to, cre but so you have to be very, uh, I would say purposeful about 
how you're bringing people back. So some people said, you know, I can save on real estate by half the people coming at one time and half the coming at the other. I think we already know that's not going to be the case because culture-wise, that's not uh, something that's going to work. How do you do it in a way by which people come together and there's po when they come together, they value coming together rather than, you know, come together and I'm in my office and Rahul's in his office and it's we might as well have been in our homes rather than in that office. So that's what I mean. How do you actually make that happen? And you will face that much more than uh, than others will for the reasons that you're describing in your industry. But I also think that what happened in that industry over that period of time, yes, you'll again get disrupted in different ways. I don't imagine that it'll be nearly as bad, although, you know, you read Bill Gates, he says, you know, there'll be a time for another pandemic to come and we better be prepared for that as well. So let's uh, let's hope he's wrong on that, but uh, he's often... Find very... your masks, folks. <laughs> Where are they? Keep them. Abha? Yep. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And uh, to give the vote of thanks, I'd like to just uh, uh, call on stage. Uh, we've got with us Nikhil Singha, Director and Head, uh, Top Tier Business at HSBC India. Nikhil. Thank you, Abha. Uh, Professor Datar uh, is a distinguished guest. Uh, it's an honor, honestly, I mean, uh, I am happy to state that I have a little bit of a uh, thing to share with you. Also, uh, one of the juniors from your institute, so that's the only commonality, and that's where it stops. <laughs> uh, but it was actually extremely enlightening. In fact, I did have a few questions, which I will possibly look at speaking with you offline. But one of the things that I was really actually very excited about to read, or hear actually, was about the point on resilient organizations you spoke about. And it actually resonated with the idea of linking it to the economic modes that, you know, uh, Warren Buffet most popularly spoke about. Yeah. And to say that how do you keep businesses competitive, mm -hmm. uh, maintain that edge um, in such a challenging environment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's, that's a matter of separate discussion and probably catch up with you offline. But uh, on behalf of HSBC, I'd like to really, really extend a very warm welcome uh, Nana Mem is here, so uh, we're actually her proteges in that sense. <laughs> but uh, it's an absolute privilege. Uh, uh, I'm from the private clients business. I had that business for India. Uh, we manage close to about 1,600 families, manage about $8.5 billion of AUM. We do have some clients who actually we, we sort of manage in this group, but, uh, but uh, we're very happy to be partnering with the India Today group here. And uh, I'd like to actually uh, thank uh, Kali as well for this opportunity to allow us to partner with the, with the, with the India Today group. Uh, and we'd be very happy to catch up uh, with a lot of you uh, offline. Our colleagues are here. Uh, they're all senior bankers from the industry, so we're happy to share our perspectives. And Professor Dutta, once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's food. I think everyone sat through a long session, so please join us for drinks outside. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. This was a lot of fun. Pleasure. Thank you so Absolutely much. Absolutely loved it. You were fantastic. It was really, really nice. <laughs>